Welcome to the Base Shed Podcast. My name is Ryan Roberts. Today on the show is bassist John Pierce. John has an amazing resume. He's been a member of Huey Lewis in the News since the early mid nineties. He's re- he's recorded with excuse me he's recorded with. Are you ready for this? Are you ready? This is a long, impressive list. How about now? Are you ready now? What about now? It's pretty impressive. You might want to be sitting down for this. All right, here we go. Here we go. John is recorded with Stevie Nicks, Reba McIntyre, Ringo Starr, Mick Jagger, Celine Dion, Steve Lukather, Chris Isaac, Bruce Hornsby, Tom Petty, and so many more. That's right. John Pierce is the bass player on Tom on Tom Petty's Wildflowers record. Uh, he's also done a bunch of movie movie soundtracks. He's going to talk a little bit about that. He's one of those guys, right? He's one of those guys. He's just crushing the studio game. He's going to talk about uh, some of these sessions and um, and how he never really wanted to be a studio musician. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. Um, yeah, so stick around for that. Before we get to my talk with John Pierce, I'd like to take a second to talk about Dan Lakin and D. Lakin basses. I'd like to publicly thank Dan Lakin for introducing me to John. Um, so this episode and uh, all the future ones that John will do, because he's he's going to be back. He's going to be back. We've we've already kind of made that a thing. John John Pierce will definitely be back. Uh, they could not have happened without Dan Lakin. So I wanted to thank that. I wanted to thank Dan for connecting us. Um, so thank you, Dan. Also, folks, I've been playing one of his J basses. I've been playing a new D Lakin bass. Um, I forgot I forgot when he sent it to me. He sent it to me, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Maybe two, two, I don't know. Sometime around Thanksgiving. Which, by the way, I don't think I've talked to you all since. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Even though I'm late and it's like, you know, a third of the way through December already. Anyways, he sent me this bass. I took it out on some gigs. I'm really into it. I love the feel of the neck. It's got a nice weight. Um, he sent it to me with flats on. Now, I'm not a flats guy. I'm not a flats guy. Um, I've used them, sp- you know, sporadically on different recording sessions and stuff if that's what the, the session needs. But, you know, my go-to bass does not have flats on it. I'm not a flats guy. So um, he sent it to me with the flats on. Those will be coming off. Um, Dan already knows that. Dan, we, we had that conversation earlier today, actually. Um, those will be coming off. But love the bass. Um and it's it's interesting because I've been playing an active bass for so long that they're, they're going back to a passive like almost my ears need to re readjust and what naturally just will come out of a passive bass. Uh, so there's there's a little bit of that just you know getting comfortable with a passive bass again. Um, he's his website is up dlakenbasses.com. You can get there from thebassshed.com. That is a shameless plug. Um, Basshed.com. Go to the little friends tab. You will see a link for D Lake and bases, and also LK straps. These LK custom straps. Um, a friend of the podcast. He's 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 based in New York, and he builds straps specifically to what you want. So go check out his website as well. I haven't gotten around to submitting my order yet, um, but I will. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that later tonight. I don't know. I will be soon. The straps look great. He's a friend of the podcast. We have some mutual friends. And uh, I'm looking forward to connecting with him. And more importantly, not more importantly, that sounds my stuff. I'm definitely interested in playing the straps. I like that I connected with him personally as well. And that's that's one of the cool things about him and the strap company is like you could talk right to him and tell him what you want. Um, as far as all the things that are related to straps, uh, it's a cool thing. Check out his website, LK Straps. Um, and so now we will get into my conversation with John Pierce. Um, this is the second second version of this podcast. The first one was done at a uh, bar restaurant in Eagle Rock, which is a part of uh, Los Angeles, at a place called The York. It is on York Street. Um, and there was just too much background noise. I couldn't end up using it, but I wanted to thank um, the manager. His name was also Ryan for letting me just set up and record a podcast there in the middle of the day. Um, I didn't call ahead or anything. I just showed up, and uh, they were all really cool with it. 
Um, I want to thank him, the uh, the staff there. Everybody was fantastic. Um, that the conversation with John at the York went on for like three hours, maybe a little over three hours. It was great. We covered so much stuff, but then then I wasn't able to use it because of the background noise. So John and I got together again, in a quieter, more controlled location, and um, and the, this was usable. But John John's just a wealth of wealth of uh, you know he's been around. He's been around. He's got all these great stories and worked with so many legends. Um, and so this we I can't even really begin to get into it all with him in one episode. So John's gonna, definitely going to be coming back. Uh, also, I left a cord over at his house. So, you know, maybe that's incentive for me to go back with a podcast rig and record another one. So here's my talk with John Pierce. Dude, uh, thanks for coming back. Thanks for doing it again. Yeah. Um, I think you're going to have a little better sound. Uh, I think so. I do. They asked me to give a shout out, so I still want to do that. We, we, we tried an attempt at the York in Eagle Rock. That's right. Uh, on York Boulevard. Yeah. The York on York, if you want to look them up. Uh, everybody there was gracious. The manager was also named Ryan. He was super cool with us letting uh, setting up a podcast and just going for it. And we just couldn't use it uh, because of background noise. And in fact, we were maybe overserved a tad, <laughs> a tad. Which is great, which is great for a bar. It loosens the lips. Yeah. <laughs> now we're just going to make a boring straight one. <laughs> yeah, now we're just going to talk about yeah. bass strings. Yeah. This is going to suck. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing I'm wondering about. I mean, bass players. There are bass players out there listening, I imagine, right? Probably. Okay. You know, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I mean, I don't know who else would listen to this. Tough call. Yeah. Bass. Scotch tape. You know how many times I've used your scotch tape yeah. joke since? Scotch yeah. tape. It's yeah. a podcast. Scotch tape. Uh, it's like, or I just threw out bass player, my bass player magazine issue. I always call it scotch tape magazine. <laughs> uh, Flea's on the cover, right? Oh, really? Well, you still haven't? Have you been on the cover? If not, I'm boycotting. I mean, I don't, I don't subscribe right now, but. Interesting point about that. I have never. So this is after it went to UK, right? Because so, uh, bass player, the brand magazine got sold to a company out of the UK. And so now the old I guys know that. from bass player magazine, now it's just called bass magazine. That there's a British ma that's another magazine, right? No, that's bass musician, I think. Ah. We need more creative titling. If you're out there yeah. and you want if you want to do a bass magazine, just uh remember that magazine called Basics in like the early 90s? Yeah, with the with the, the with uh, the clef. Bass clef, right? Yeah, that was short-lived. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't I don't think it's still out there. Well, again, we'll see. I don't know what the numbers you know are for amount of bass players in in the US. Right. Or working bass players, but it's not a lot. Sure. I'm just going to. And uh, I have never, ever had anything written about me really? as a bass player. It's bullshit. I'm a horrible self promoter. I, it's, you know. <laughs> well, I mean. But this is a big start for me. That's why we're doing the podcast. The, well, the, this is this is this a start is for you. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope you get the attention of bass player. <laughs> if you're listening, yeah. I'm available for, you know, just a little tiny little bit about. I don't know because I noticed some of the people that they they talk know, to interview. I mean, I you know, you know, I don't even know. I don't even know. Oh, I, mean, I see what you're saying. But uh, my favorite thing this month is Flea's quote right here. Is it about Scotch tape? Where's that? Right there below the tape. <clears throat> <laughs> Pain. So here's here's the quote from the magazine: "Pain and turmoil and anxiety are very difficult." Flea. Well put, Flea. Yeah. Well, well done, buddy. Yeah. There it is. Oh man, I got a funny story about this. Did you know this guy? Mike Watt. Not at all. I know. I know who he is. And uh, I. Wait, hold on. Is that the guy I'm thinking of? Is this the dude that? Uh, who's Mike Watt? He's the. He's Mike Watt. Is like the. Oh, he's the punk guy. Quintessential alternative bass guy. Oh, no, I'm thinking about somebody else. The dude that was playing with uh, Tom Waits. Ooh. He just passed. Oh, who would that have been? I forgot his name. Uh, he, uh, Canned Heat. He played with Canned Heat. 
can't he? Well, this guy was probably not a young guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't pass shockingly young or anything. No, 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 no. I'll tell you. I'll tell you the story uh, behind yeah. this. Yeah. Um, Too bad the folks don't get to hear about this, but that's okay. <laughs> no, it's it's all right. You never been in here. No, nothing. No, and Dan always uh, Dan Lakin who. Sure. Uh, we, I guess we got to throw him in here, right? Yeah, let's uh, uh, throw as him a, in here, throw a, him under the bus, whatever we need to do. He knew the, I think, a, a previous editor or something, and he always used to, he, he would try to get, or... No, I, I think he knows uh, Jim, Jim Roberts. That's right. That's which is Which I think is hilarious, because that's also my dad's name. Jim Roberts is your dad? Yeah. I mean, not that Jim Roberts. It's a different Jim Roberts. That's what's weird. When it's, yeah, huh. your dad, your dad. Uh... There's probably a couple of James Roberts in the I world. Know, yeah, I don't think it's a completely unique name. I, I think there's a, mu a few John Pierces. Possible. And I think there's probably a few Ryan Roberts. Yeah. One's a baseball player. Like I've I've Googled myself before. One of them was, uh, the, I think he plays for the Diamondbacks or something in Arizona. Currently? I think. A few years ago, he was still active. Name sounds really familiar, yeah. and I am a big baseball fan. Are you a baseball fan? Yeah, huge baseball. You're fan. originally from uh, here. You're originally from NoHo. Where? Yeah, that's right. North Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, I grew up there. St uh, lived one year. Actually, lived the first year of my life in Hollywood. Okay. And that's then we moved to North Hollywood. Sure. Big move. Yeah. And uh, it's not far, but. Uh, Culture-wise, a big shift. Any folks that know the L.A. area, yeah, yeah. North Hollywood it's and Hollywood are two different. Very, very differently. Different people. Yeah. All different spiel. Exactly. Different hustle. Should we, um, get a, should we Now it's probably the time to have a couple of shots of tequila. Right? Uh, before we talk about NoHo? <laughs> 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 the third time we do this then, mm -hmm. I'm going to need to not have a gig when at we night. eventually <laughs> do this, I mean, you're going to... Yeah. The, I, I can tell I'm going to be just be this thing that the 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 podcast that you you know like the Loch Ness monster of I'm episodes so like sure. you will never be caught. Yeah, because Dan forced you to do this, right? He didn't force. He introduced. Right. He introduced us. Uh, no, he didn't force. And me. folks, I just want any anybody to know one thing about Ryan. Uh oh. Uh, and I just discovered this back in my little playroom back there. This guy can play bass. <laughs> Um, and so it's a little weird. I feel like perhaps we could switch chairs here because, um, Brian, you're a serious bass player. Oh, well, thank you, sir. Thank yeah. You. I mean, I can't play that fast. Ah, uh, you have the resume though. See, see where it got me? Well, it speed, got me nowhere. The speed doesn't, yeah. doesn't get <laughs> let's you Let's talk about that. Let's act, let's talk about that. Actually. Let's talk about technique versus, uh, the fundamentals of actually being a bass player. It depends what you want to do. What's the uh, end game for your bass? I mean, do you want to be the greatest bass player that ever lived? Do you want to be the? I mean, or who? Are, you know, who are you? Well, then you have to like who? Who are you competing against? You know, like if you if 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 I wanted to be the best 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 bass player that ever lived, who am I trying to outdo right now? If I'm trying to outdo Jocko or something, then that's going to send me down that thing you know, if i wanted to outdo mike watt then that's a different uh, group of talents and uh, skills absolutely absolutely you know it really is i think that um it just it really depends now the question is how do you make a i mean one thing to sort of decide early on or not early you don't have to ever decide but do you do you want to make money doing this is this a career is sure. this i mean do you it, if it's going to be a career, then you have to think about, you know, you have to look at the people that are successful doing it or mm -hmm. have been successful doing it um, as a career. And in most cases, these, you know, as you bass players out there know, we're kind of pretty much the unsung guy. And yeah. our names aren't house, especially the guys that are on the records, not household names. Sure. And... Uh, there's, you have to sort of decide. You see, I didn't want to be. I never thought I would ever be a studio musician. Right. I, I like that story. That's yeah. hilarious. So that's one thing we covered last time. Like you wanted to be a band guy. That was your I thing. I always like, want to be a band guy. Yeah. You know. I mean, yeah. When I was telling you last time, like at the time, like 
you know, when we were kids, we were listening to a lot of prog rock. You mm-hmm. know? I was a big Yes fan and Jethro Tull and all this stuff. And our band, our band, when I was like, I think I was 12 years old, and I was the lead singer in the band, and we got somehow through the drummer's dad or whatever, we got uh, an actual pro job to do a record. Yeah. To, it was called Moses and the Impossible Ten. And the three, record was? What was what was called that? That was the name that of the was record? That was the album. Okay. Yeah. And it was like a, almost like a... So the record existed, and they just wanted you to feature a couple tunes on it, or they wanted you to do it the whole not record? A, no, they were, they were making... It was almost like going to be a rock opera. Okay, okay. Sometime after Tommy or whatever. Yeah. Or, it has that feel to it, just by the name. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was a biblical... It was by biblical stories, and... Yeah. I had written, like, these three sort of war protest songs that for some reason or another... And they, how are they going to use that? Was that going to be like the the theme music for the Israelites leaving Pharaoh or something? Was I like don't, that? You know what? I never could understand any of it. So, <laughs> who knows? But yeah, okay. the album exists. I could find it for you. It's yeah. really a trip to listen to. <laughs> uh, but That'll what be happens a tequila is hang. That'll our be a tequila band, hang. our you know, we go in and we actually get a recording session, and this is the, our first time in the studio. And I'm in the vocal booth doing my vocal, and I was the, uh, I was the first one to go. Well, we gotta get rid of the, we're gonna have to get rid of the singer, that's for sure. So I went. Then uh, they wouldn't even let you stay on as bass player, huh? Like you, well, you I were, wasn't playing bass yet. Oh, you were just singing. Yeah, I was. Okay. I was a singer at the time. I was a singer, and I was writing for the band. So. Yeah. But what happened is we were replaced by studio musicians. Right. So from that time on. That was the geekiest job because we, you know, they came in with their phony baloney distortion pedals right. and everything sounded, you know, the drummer was John Guerin, <laughs> who we had no clue who he was. He, you know, would later find out he was an excellent jazz drummer. And yeah. Would later go on to work with Joni Mitchell, blah, blah, blah. But it was... No, this was not what we wanted. This is this was the antithesis of what we liked. Right, it wasn't this cool. Was so lame. Yeah. So the fact that I ended up as a studio musician, <laughs> it's ironic. It's just I, I had uh, no idea. That's why it's really tough to, you know, so much. I find that so many things in life, you know, they they just come at you. Yeah. Without any warning or. Sure. It's so. It's just a crapshoot out there, kids. Yeah, and, <laughs> that's right. Uh, but if you and getting tougher, oh, I, I mean, can, like, I, 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 I want to know from your perspective, like, how has the studio session scene changed? It's it, well, it's dramatically from all the sessions dried up. you were doing. Right, yeah. it has dried up. I mean, when I I got to L.A. in '06, and I was doing a bunch of hip hop sessions. That would be the only thing you could, and you lucky to be doing that. Yeah, that was cool, and um. And it was fun and all that. And then, like, within two years later, like, even those dried up, you know. And then it turned into, like, singer-songwriters with private budget trying to get a record done or something like that. But it's not – it wasn't the same. They was going in and just playing their record. It wasn't like I was doing a lot of sessions. Those were No, it's been – I would say the, the, you know, by the late 90s, we started to really see the – bass pool recede or just you know the de- the demand uh-huh. was no longer there you know i mean it, it's like even today you you look at your top 40 chr you know whatever not a lot of bass guitars on right. the radio a lot of synth bass now i mean i like to think that it's kind of making a little comeback sounds like it i'd hope so but but then there's like well there's now what's on the radio versus like what's on Spotify and there's so many platforms to hear music. Well, you like see, that's just it. The irony is the the guys that uh, whether you're a Victor well Victor Wooten probably is an exception, but there there is there are a lot of great chopsy sure. slappers. But uh, I got to tell you all the you're not going to make much money doing that. I, no, I mean even. I'm sure Victor Wooten does great. Does well, fine. Yeah, I'm sure he does. But, but he's also diversified his thing. He's right. Um, written a book. He's written books. He does the tapes. He's he's merchandised himself. 
You know, right. he's. I don't know if it's Victor specifically or if it's Victor as a manager that we started the Whoop Camp. Yeah, I think he's done better than me at, <laughs> at promoting his. He's um, but he's he's definitely learned how to merchandise himself and create. He's not just playing. No, and I think you know? that's. I think that's probably really smart. I think I really think that in this day and age, you can't just play. No, I mean not not for people. I'm 38, so if people of my generation are younger, like I don't think you can anymore. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, and please email me if I am. Uh, well, my question, the, actually, a question for you then: Is social media still does it help? Is it does it help? I don't know. I've played with it back and forth. I've done like social experiments. Well, like I will post about every gig or most of them. Uh, no matter how trivial they may or may not be within the grand scheme of music. Um, and then I've not you know, posted about anything. Right now, I don't post about anything. You don't? No. Nothing? Just uh, nothing to say? or I or mean, you know, does a plumber post about every time he goes and unclogs the drain? Like, I'm working. This is my job. Wait till they see this. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to blow their Man, minds. Instagram is just going to go off the charts with plumbers. Yeah, that's a... Well, that's a good point. Well, I've never done a lick of social media. I never good for you. signed up for the Facebooks. Uh. And um, yeah, good for me. But, I, you know, I, I could have done a little better job. But but this kind of goes back to what you were saying is like, what's what's your end game with it? Right. And and what is a uh, an article? And, you know, I don't want to demean in a base publication. Yeah. Uh. What does that do? Like, is that going to get you? uh you know, it's like I used to think, you know, when we, uh, uh, you go to music school, yeah. go to Berkeley or whatever, does the degree, do you bring the degree with you to the studio? <laughs> like, do you just go in any studio with your degree and show it? And, oh. you know, it doesn't. Oh, here's my GPA. So that means I can. Like anything else in this, I mean, it's. You're always. You, the good news is you're always one person away. From starting a snowball sure. of some kind. I agree with and that. And you never know. So take any gig you can mm -hmm. early on, no matter how bad, or I mean, and do as great a job as you possibly can. Because sure. you really never know who's gonna hear it. And 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 the stuff that's that that's come at me that's been cool really came out of the blue. Yeah. You know. But it certainly was it came from a connected, you know, there was a web of some kind. Yeah, there was a network involved. Absolutely. Um, now, I know you played with Kenny Loggins. You did, what, one record, two I records? I think I just did one. I, 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 and I think it was just, yeah, maybe just one song with Kenny. Oh, okay. Was, two. was Herman Matthews on that record? Because I did one of these with Herman Matthews. And he's got a uh, an interesting story about just, like, you know, coming out here on a whim. And then, like, he had two nights at the potato and then everybody who was there that weekend like ended up facilitating almost the rest of his career. You, you know, know, just I, one of those things. That's interesting. Yeah, it's a, no, it's a really fascinating it. story. I mean, he can play, and he's a great hang and all that. Um, but, yeah, I agree with him. Like, it's but, all, everybody's always kind of right there. Everybody, I, I think this, who will be a part of your the next chapter of your life in any sense, was already on the radar. Somehow or another. Yeah. Whether you knew them directly and then, you know, whatever. However that turns out for anybody's story. But it's it's always already there. Yeah. I think the lesson is even on the on the crappiest, what you may perceive as the crappiest gig and most horrible music you've ever played, man, give it your all and, and, and uh, you know, th this is cliche stuff, but being a team player. Sure. Is, sure. is is huge. Yeah, I think so. Now, uh, something I do like to ask people on here before. What's a, what's a gig story? Like, not just a gig story, but like the worst gig, something so erratic happened, something, you know, like surreal, some, some kind of major catastrophe on a gig. A catastrophe? On not a gig necessarily. Like a or it could be like just something really bizarre. Something there's uh, really there's been some musicians story. on here that just shared these hilarious stories to me, just gig stories. Well, I mean, 
I, for me, it's always like, you, it's just the situations that I've ended up being in. I mean, whether it be like someone like Mick Jagger or Rod Stewart or somebody like these, you're, you remember Zelig, the Woody Allen movie? Did you ever I see I never it? saw it. Well, that, that was just a guy that he's just this ubiquitous, ubiquitous guy that just ends up in all these famous places, you know. Okay. There's one scene where he's on deck as a Yankee, you know. Was this kind of like a Forrest Gumpish, where Forrest was always just kind of around all these... Uh, well, they called him the chameleon because he could turn into anything at any time, but okay. he was always with whoever was president, whoever... You he was know, just he, always on the scene, Yeah, you know, he's like, how did that guy get here? Yeah. And to me, that's just like, it, those are always the weird things. Like, you know, like you're on stage... And then Mick Jagger comes over to groove with you. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm just thinking, what's going on here? What is this? This yeah. cannot be. Sure. Uh, this is impossible. Yeah. And it's those, uh, you know, the, those are the most whacked out stories to me. The people I've got, you know, the the uh, the iconic singers that coming, o come o coming over to groove with you. Yeah. You it's know. killing. And, of course, I just kicked him because i don't like people coming over to right no you me. got space so issues i, I get it that's why way. you're on the other side of the table right now get like it. i can't get too close get out of here yeah <laughs> beat it beat it yeah you scram know. yeah scram <laughs> singer <laughs> damn singers uh but there have been let me think in terms of catastrophic events um i mean other than getting fired and stuff like that i mean is it a funny story other than just like you get a phone call, I mean that sucks, but it's not funny. Like what do you got? What do you got that's funny? Yeah, that's never funny. No, getting fired is never that's not funny. funny. Uh, we you did know, talk about this. Though. We did talk about this last time. Is the idea of putting all your eggs in one basket? I remember uh, we talked a little bit about that. Well, uh, I'm, I'm sort of dealing with the repercussions of that right now, in a sense, you know, uh, because of Huey. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, is it everything health, everything well, okay health wise, or well, just like well, just dates little, are drying up. What it is is, uh, uh, Huey has Meniere's disease, which okay. is uh, basically it's a disease of the inner ear, and right now Huey can't hear tonal center, can't hear pitch. Wow, which to me doesn't seem like a real deal breaker. <laughs> for rock and roll band, but uh, he seems to... <laughs> he seems to find it important. You know, and, like, and <laughs> managers and say, you know, they'll, they'll always tell him, don't worry about it, going, nobody cares. Yeah. And he, he, he points out, wait a minute, I care. Sure that's a big one, sure. Yeah, I care. But, um, yeah, don't uh, try, try to eliminate, try to just have as many groups of, of musicians to work with so that you're playing different types of music, which I is think that's really, yeah. and um, what happened to me, but yeah, 25 years on the road with Huey, uh. I'm sure didn't, you know, help me, I mean, to, to, produ to a lot of producers in L.A., I probably disappeared, and the, then you know, once you, they'll call you two, three times, but yeah, yeah. if you keep saying nah, unavailable, unavailable, um, that's the thing, man. That's the thing. I that's the thing. I I'm very aware of in town. It's like I got to come through for somebody, you know, if I'm going to say yes to their gig in general, five, six times before I can even like I'll cancel other things. You, you know, it's always like a game of Tetris to always come through for the new one. And you to know, build this the rapport. tough thing about that is like, y you don't know, you might be making the wrong decision. I know. I just know. had that the other day about, about some gigs, uh, like which so one, you might've just messed up the rest of your life. Well, you know, you, you got a spare room here. Be, I might yeah. need to. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> right. Sweet. And plenty of bases too. Perfect. If we can find them all, we need yeah. low jacks. Yeah. We on, have uh, a problem finding a few instruments, uh, but, um, the um, there there was a point I was going to get to about the uh, eggs in one basket and, and Huey and all that. Oh yeah, I remember in ninety four, which is ninety three ninety four, when I took on the Huey gig permanently. Uh, I remember Rick Morata, the drummer, <coughs> going, "What are you doing, man? You can't do that. You you're gonna fuck up your career, man. You're gonna fuck oh, up your whole studio career." Yeah, you know. And I go, 
well, whatever. You now, know. why'd you do it? Did you do it because of... Because uh, I'm a band guy. Right. That's where I was going. Yeah. Because you, you just... Want to be a band. Yeah. Plus, uh, as I told you before, my first um, exposure to Huey was 1986. Right. And you did like... Um, you had like 24 hours to learn. Not even. Yeah. Not even. Got a call from management. Uh, what are you doing tomorrow night? Yeah, yeah. Huey's at the apex of his career. Fifteen thousand dollars sold out. Fifteen thousand? No, fifteen thousand people yeah. <laughs> sold out. Fifteen thousand people sold out arenas, and I had to learn the uh, show, you know, in about sixteen hours. How much of it did you know? Uh, well, I do know that Mario Cipollina, who was the who was the original bass player. Okay. We can get to the luggage mishap. Oh, man, we need to revisit yeah. the unfortunate luggage. Well, I guess it's a good place to go. Yeah. In 1986, when I got the call, mm -hmm. they said that Mario had been involved <laughs> in, with a, in a bizarre luggage mishap. And, I should have uh, used that yesterday. Or like, when was it, earlier in the week? Because we were supposed to do this a few days ago. Man, I totally, I, man, I had a... Unfortunate luggage mishap. mishap. It's, it's, I won't be able to make it till Friday. More common than people realize. It's, it's a these, real threat out there, folks. These luggage, yeah. yeah. Get your luggage safety together. I don't know what happened to Mario. I don't really know the story. Of, but but I went with it. He was in some form of a cast. Okay. For what it's worth. But I spent... The, um, I flew in to somewhere in Texas. I think it was Dallas or something. But... Spent the day in Mario's hotel room, and he was just showing me how he did all the parts. And okay. I, so I shed as much as I can those few hours before the show. Right. And then during the show, Mario was holding up uh, cards. Yeah, the know, cue cards. Cue cards, yeah. <laughs> D. Yeah. C. For just the key center of the tune? No, actual parts. You oh, know, really? like, yeah, he was <laughs> shuffling them. I mean, I don't know. So, I bet so you he's got this luggage issue. He's got a broken arm or a cast and somewhere. he's still able to... But he's still on scene. He's still... Which he's, was, I found a little weird, too. Yeah. What, yeah, I mean, it's almost like he's getting grounded from the gig. Not necessarily fire to let go or anything. Yeah, just, right? Yeah. It's just like, yeah. all right, you, don't, you can't play the next three shows. And, I, and when he was in the room showing me the parts, just fine. Yeah, spirits up like he wasn't. You know, he, he wasn't was salty. It. He was playing it. He was going. No, really? No, man, that's wrong. Give me the bass. <laughs> you know, um, and I do it like this. You know, Mario though had. Uh, Where's I, he at now? He's uh, he's still up in the Bay Area. Yeah. Really? Um, but Does he, own uh, a luggage store? he one thing I had to do, or at least figure out how to do. Mario had this weird thing where you know he used a. What do you call it? You know, like a thumb pick. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. Like a banjo thumb sure. pick. And he would tape that onto his thumb. And that was his, that primarily was his, his sound. Really? So he didn't play with his index or middle finger at all? It was all just thumb? Yeah, really? at the time. Yeah, pre Wooten. And, and he wanted me to do that. Uh, what do they call that, by the way? What do you kids call that now? The, uh, the, the Wooten thing? No, the, it's not like it's. There's slapping, and then now there's this the, other thing that I, I know. Well, I don't know what I mean. There's slapping, there's the slap pop thing. Then there's all that three finger, all the fusion guys. Are I suppose doing. that's it. The three Sometimes finger. Sometimes four. Right. Yeah. Like it just keeps going. It's Some interesting. Point, like, you, but it's yeah, very. The, that's a. It's a quiet sound, right? It's not an aggressive. I don't think you can rock. I mean, right. all those dudes have super low action, and they're you know playing all the notes. That's true. Yeah. Um, but he wanted me to do so. I think I did have to strap on the thumb pick for certain songs to, mm. to you know, and you know, it's one thing to have to learn songs, but then to a new technique at yeah. the same night. If there were, if there is a, a tape of that show somewhere, I bet there might be a, a f just a few clams, <laughs> just a few. But I did it for a month. Okay. Before the luggage. Right, he was Whatever healed up. Whatever injury, it healed up. Now, yeah. now let's. This is worth noting. This wasn't the only luggage mishap. He he no. would he would suffer. No, he would encounter. Uh, he would have another. I want to say three years later. Okay. I got a call. Which is even funnier. Get ready. Uh, Mario had another <laughs> incident with luggage. 
so <laughs> here's here's the stuff to listen to. Here's the new album. Here's a live board tape. Get get on it. Yeah. Uh, never did get called back for that particular one, but but yeah, the the thing is, ever since that '86 run, I really wanted to be in the band. Yeah. I really now, did, did. You know any of the guys in the band before you got the call? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was in a band called Pablo Cruz. Okay. Which your kid, your parents know of Pablo Cruz. I trust me on this, but um, same manager. Okay. So they were they were made, around. Yeah, they were making sports. Uh, we were doing at the record plant in Sausalito. Huey was making the album Sports while we were doing a Pablo record just across the hall. Okay. Cool. Studio B or whatever. They were an A. Yeah. So I met him all then. Okay. And so we were kind of friends. And Okay. So it wasn't like you were totally walking in cold? No. Not at all. Now, when you would go do some of those sessions, what would you get as far as notes? Were you writing? Or were you making a part in real time with artists in the band? Were you, were you getting charts? Like, when you would get into, like, a kind of a, a typical session date back during those times, what, what were you given as a studio musician? Mostly chord charts, okay. maps, you know, some written ideas notes here and there. Yeah. Maybe some, you know, uh, you know, ensemble stuff that was, to, you know, that, sure. that was, but, but really, um, no, you, they, they hired you to come up with the bass part. Okay, so they gave you a fair amount of freedom. Absolutely. Okay. Except for some, there were some arrangers, producers that would be specific and 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 have uh, all the notes written out. Is that just like per tune within a record? They would have that, like this one. Yeah, some. Guys or would that's just do the it. production style. Like but they're really micromanaging. Eighty percent of it was basic chord charts, outlines. Okay. And. You know, it got to actually at that time I was a good enough sight reader that it was easier to read to just the notation, read the note, than actually come up with. You know, yeah, um, yeah. That's a definite. That's a whole other skill and sensibility. I love it. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Studio work. I mean, it, it, that's what they're kind of hiring you for. Sure. They. I mean, they, they want you to bring something to the table. Yeah, the right. spirit, whatever you do, and and. Uh, I mean, they're hiring you for whether maybe not a sound necessarily, but yeah, they want you to do your thing. Yeah, an approach. Yeah, and yeah. and help out. Right. Help out. You do so. Yeah. No, I look at it like uh, like medicine in in the sense that musicians were specialists, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and we're head of the bass department. Right. Exactly. And that's our. You know, I mean, people can chime in and give ideas, of course. But we're entrusted with the base department. Yeah. Most of the time we're yeah. trusted. Sometimes we're not trusted. But uh, as time goes on, you, yeah, it's you, you need to uh, be able to look at a G minor and be listening to the song and know what, not just what notes are available to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't want to just run through your G minor repertoire. You want to... I, you know, I can never say enough about song focus. Sure, sure. Um, like, uh, let's talk I, about that because we didn't we didn't talk about that last no, time. No, and the worst thing for me is when you get a track without a vocal. Sure. Uh, that to me, I might as well be blind and gagged, uh -huh. and, and you know, I have no idea. There's no context for anything you're gonna do. Maybe okay, now you know what a kick drum is doing, or you know what a guitar part is to lock in with that. But that's that, that. None of that matters no. without a melody. I really need the singer. Sure. And I, I, I never even realized at the time. But when I listen back now to like the things that I did that you know were either hits or whatever. There's, I mean, I'm really playing to the vocal. Yeah. I mean, it, it is just as much as to the drummer, you know, sure. whatever. But the vocal's key. So without it, I'm lost, and I just need. Just please, somebody go up there and sing a rough one. I don't care if it's out of tune. Right. But give me an idea of what we're trying to do here. What, 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 you know. Sure. It, that helps, uh, you know, it helps me moving forward with it the It helps track. everything. I mean, you can't, you can't play a bass line. You can't create a bass part without all the information. I think so. You I know. mean, what would, I mean, then what you're would just Jamerson have sounded like 
without anybody singing. No, he would have been ordering another beer. Yeah. Like he'd still be <laughs> yeah. at the bar. That's what he sounded like. Yeah. Like I'll have a double. No, but talk about a guy that's like really feeding off the vocal. Oh man, right? so much. So and that's much. what the good ones do. Yeah, I They're think so. So song driven. And he took I mean, like we were talking earlier, he I mean, he took everything into account. Everything into account. And equally as important, the other funk brothers let him do it. They kind of stayed out of his way. Yeah, I would really love to have seen it when before he got maybe, you know, overserved or whatever. Or sure, I mean, we all know the story from the movie. You mm-hmm. know, of um, what Marvin Gaye song was it? He's What's on, going on? He's on his back. Yeah, first take on his back. Yeah, unbelievable. 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 Like I've transcribed the line. The line's compositionally astounding. That is like, amazing. It's wow. And, like, to think that he was on some level frustrated for something. If he was able to go full on, you know, and just be who he wanted to be without being a frustrated studio musician, as I assume he was. You think so? I don't know. Hmm. I mean, I know there's a lot of documentation that he was frustrated about the royalties. Oh, God, well, they were but c- then like certainly underpaid I mean, yeah. beyond belief, you know. But then right around the time Motown moved out here, like they put him on this salary that's really that's really good. The way I found, you know, and, and this is sad, but um, some of my first gigs were replacing mm-hmm. his parts. Really? On records. Out you know? here? Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever meet him? Never did. Oh, man. No. Never did, but heard him and heard him when he was not at his best. Sure. Like playing like, I don't know, like a new bass and it just didn't sound like him. And yeah, you know, music had changed. It was sure. Right. The technology is really multi-tracking. Yeah. It's becoming a different thing. And uh, yeah, from everything I've read about him, like he came out here and just like that was the it really broke his spirit. It did. I mean, from what I've read, I don't know if that to be true, but. I don't doubt it. It was too. It was so different than yeah, what he was used to. And, and you know, yeah, I don't think L.A. was a good fit. Clearly, mm. right. And yeah, it was sad to see a, a an icon like that. And you know, replacing parts. And at first, you go, well, I can't do that. I'm not going to replace Jamerson's parts. But you listen to me. He went well. It you needs know, to be maybe replaced. Maybe it needs to be <laughs> replaced. Yeah. What records were those that you did? I, I, you know, I don't even recall. Okay. I would never even know. That's the one problem is uh, I have to look at the, the discography. I don't remember a lot of things from the, those early first two years of sessioning. What year? What years were these? 77. Yeah. Okay. 78. Sure. Through seventy nine, that was when it got. That's when and, it and this out. is around the time that you came back to L A. from Berkeley, right? Yeah, yeah. Right after, I okay. went right into the. Uh, Man, what a, what an intense thing! So you're out there on the East Coast. You said you, you know, you were you were hanging around while Jocko was doing his thing in New York. Well, I wasn't hanging around with him, but I. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, you weren't on the basketball court, you know, sleeping next to him on the park no, bench or whatever. No, no, and I get, I get my base in a case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as opposed to the plastic bag, which was cool, but. <laughs> I mean, it depends um, on the plastic bag. Yeah, Is it no, a mono plastic bag. I, <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Poor Jocko. But I mean, you you you're out there, and that legend is on that coast, and you come back here, and Jamerson's out here, and like, man, what an exciting. Uh, well, thing. I w- you know, and this is where good friends come. You know, I, yeah, I. What what happened is before I went to Berkeley, I you know, first of all, I I got started a little late with bass. Like sixteen was maybe a little late, but. You know, I'd been through singing and drums and violin and whatnot, so music right. was always there. But to bass really grabbed me at 16, and that's when I went like full force, and then started to do some work. And, and you know, I have my little neighborhood friends like sure. Steve Lukather and Mike Landau and yeah. these guys. Um, did, they, did they go on to stay in music? Did those guys stay in music at yeah, all? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I mean, I was I had like these connections that are just completely lucky neighborhood that just kids in the neighborhood yeah I mean, you can't get luckier than that 
And I realized that they were, uh, I was going to have to really step up my game, you know, to sort of keep up with my buds, you know. Sure. So what I, I did three semesters at Berkeley. And when I got out of there, I could sight read really well. Yeah. And I, I, I told you the story last time with the, uh, one of the first things. Uh, it wasn't that a, a Bette Midler? Bette Midler. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I got called to do an audition and it was already preset that I would not be getting the gig because the uh, musical director had his friend that was going to get it. Sure. And so he told all the musicians, look, this guy, we're going to audition a few people just for vet because she yeah. wants to see, but this guy's getting the gig. Okay. But I got in and then, you know, they try to stump the bass player. Yeah. You know, fun game. Always so, a so fun everybody's, game. Everybody's given all the bass players that they know they're not going to have to work with. Yeah. They, they're just a, giving them a hard time. Yeah, it was this big chart. They okay. said, let's give them the big one. Yeah. It was called Big Noise from Winnetka. It was about <laughs> 15 pages, about three music stands. And, uh, you know, this is where hats off. This, this is where Berkeley came in handy. Yeah. Because I did zip through it. Right. And at the end of it, was it a? Do you remember it being a specifically challenging chart, or was it just a lot to digest? It was long. It was yeah. hard on you know my head sure. zipping back and like where the repeat coda you know right, uh, right. coda number two like just goofy stuff. But I was so my chops were just at the were as good as they'd ever be in my life. So, yeah. and at the end of the run, Bet goes, "I want him." Great. End of story. Yeah. We'd all become friends, even though their friend didn't get to be the bass yeah, yeah. player. But um, that started a lot of stuff. So the band, the band didn't vibe you out, or like the MD didn't vibe you out because we still stay in touch. Good oh, friends, really, still good friends of mine. Cool. And uh, it was great. You know, it was fun to be uh, 19, 19, 20 and go to New York for my first time. We were That's on Broad great. Broadway for three months. Yeah. I got to meet Will Lee that way. Okay. What was that like being 19 and being on a big gig? You're on Broadway. You're 19. Like, you're young. You know, it's so funny. Did when it's actually it going on, you don't. You okay. don't get caught up in it. You don't. There's just no time to reflect. Yeah. You're, you're just do. You know, you're. It, it's, it's strange. When you're right in the midst of, you know having your moment or whatever, or one of your moments, one sure. of your runs, you're just not aware of it. Because it's like you're in the zone, right? Yeah. It's like an athlete, and they're, you're just, things are just happening. Yeah. So you're not going, wow. Yeah. Until Mick Jagger comes over to, to dance with you. Right. And then you go, <laughs> this is weird. Okay, so no tumultuous gig story. Most, let's say the top three career highlights not as if your career is over by any means but out of all the things you've done sessions stage tours oh. what are, i mean that, that seems like that's a big one obviously it's a big one he's a global icon mick jagger yeah that so him was coming over fun. to you on stage is like yeah that's yeah a, that's well that was funny just not the, only was he uh, an icon but we, that was three months you okay. know it was three months uh, being just with mick day in day out and then Going to London and making a video yeah. and doing some gigs, you know, uh, we didn't do, we just did a few gigs in New York, but okay. in like clubs and stuff, it was a blast. That's amazing. So yeah, as far as, um, but, but, um, g great front men, gal, I mean, Bet was just on par, absolutely, in terms of being a front man, you yeah. know, she was unbelievable. So... So, yeah, those are the, these are the, the, the their highlights and how uh, and Huey. Yeah, that's his another as good a front man as as they come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good, and that's a big deal, you know. I mean, just they're not going to bore the audience, right? You know, and um, who else? I don't. Now, what's it like to play <clears throat> that music? For so long, and not, not kind of half-ass it. Like, is it a challenge? Is it something you had to cultivate? Is just check in as if it's the first time? Because there's a lot of times, it might be the first time. Maybe not now, but 
the first time they would go see Huey Lewis in the News live, but you've been playing this music so long. And so well, you have to give them the new first time experience. But for you, you can play it in your sleep. Well, you mean, oh, you mean, what's like bringing it like the playing energy the same to the music. songs? Yeah, uh, bringing that to the, I well, mean, on the in town thing, whether it's a straight ahead gig and it's standards that I've played a zillion times or with an R&B singer that oh, I got to play this tune again. Uh, it's a struggle to commit musically. Well, you know, I think one thing that helps, you know, if there's, you know, five to 10,000 people, that always helps a little yes. bit. It Agreed. gets your attention. You don't want to make a fool of yourself. And I, I always, I swear every night, and I would do the, I'll do that, you know, when we kick it up again. I want to be better than last night where right. I want to try something new. Okay. And especially with material that's not um, Stravinsky. Right. I mean, that's, it, it's, you know, it's always the simple stuff that's the hardest to, it took me actually as, it took me several years to be comfortable playing, Playing with you, I, I really? found it to be one of the hardest things I had ever done. What was the uh, what was kind of some of the variables? It was just like I never felt like I was like I just had yet to find my voice within it within you know, that because music. I was taking pieces yeah. of what Mario had done, but I wanted to, you know I still had to be myself and and so it took it it took. For a long time. It was like hmm. a. It, there was a real rub there for me. And How much of it was not to throw Huey under the bus, but to that he was kind of married to Mario's part. Not at all. Huey. He was did, totally cool with letting you do what you did, and you were just maybe in your own head a little. It was all. It was definitely all in my head. Yeah, I would have done the same. You know. The, yeah. Like I, he. You know. He had the gig. I got to sound like him. Yeah. It's a, I was more likely to be like, like other guys in the band were more likely to point out. You know the guitar player or the or the keyboard player yeah. were more likely to point out uh, in the bridge you're, you play that you're playing the wrong. Oh, or, yeah. or that's not what you know. Uh, but Huey, he didn't. You yeah, know. he let you do your thing. Yeah, yeah. You just you just you're fine, man. You just go. Right. You go. You know? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's cool. What else, what else did we cover from last time that was. Uh it seems like we covered a lot last time. There, there's a lot. There's, well, there's, 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 there's some good there's moments a there. A few things. Um, Most of the time, if I have to, like, if I lose the file or something, and have to re. Right. I don't. I try not to go back to anything. No, actually, it's not purposeful. I don't go back to anything we discussed because I already know it. Yeah. You know what it's I mean? It's not fun. Yeah, no, it's not I fun. And I don't want that. it to sound yeah. canned. Rep uh, repeti yeah, yeah, I'm not like, into that. Yeah, it's like canned. Yeah. Um. I know uh, one story that, uh, you know, we, we talk about, you know, we, we, I don't know, th th this is coming out of the blue a little bit, but um, Paul Westerberg, um, and I know that Dan told me that you didn't know who the replacements were. That's probably true. The band. Right. And funny you should say that because either did I. Okay. And I'm working with Paul Westerberg. Okay. <laughs> and he's the leader. Of, and I still, you know, when I got called to do the, the producer gig. Uh -huh. um, Are you doing the, the road Matt gig? Wallace, or the Matt Wallace. It was uh, Paul Westerberg. It was called 14 Songs. That's the record? Yeah. Okay. And. But there's only nine on the record. <laughs> is that. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't even know. You might I'm be just, right. No, I just think it'd it be hilarious. 14, like 14 songs, but it's just a 6 2 EP. You, yeah, it's just Paul being. Paul. Yes. But yeah, I never knew anything about the replacements, but it turns out they were uh, pretty much a, a hardcore alt rocking, not particularly in tune or in time band. Oh, wow. You know? What year was this? 94. Okay. So, like, kind of grunge, post grunge yeah. kind of thing? But. What happened was Paul was really interesting because, uh, oh, and I've uh, I had Jimmy Iovine, the producer, yeah, yeah. Had, he had a similar thing. I had a similar thing with him on a Stevie Nicks thing. But um, with Jimmy's thing was like he came over. He says, uh, "Are you comfortable with your part?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels good." Yeah. He goes, "Well, then it's the wrong part." <laughs> 
Oh. <laughs> These are the things that cats have to, you know, yeah, this is, no, I'm, don't yeah, know like, about, yeah. Try, try, you know. Really? Okay. So. Why did you, why did you write a part, Jimmy? Yeah. No, the, the point is there has to be some struggle. Sure. And this is where Paul Westerberg one day, we're tracking some song. I don't know what bass I had. The struggle, like he wants you to reach for it. He, he goes, wants this kind go, of sense of desperation in there. He goes, you know what, man? Uh, stop the tape. Stop, stop the tape. Uh, John, come with me. We're going to the ba- we're going to the music store. We got to get you new bass. <laughs> okay. And so Paul Westerbrook takes me shopping, bass shopping, and he was looking for the hardest instrument to play. He wanted the highest action. Oh wow! The worst sounding. Yeah. And <laughs> there she is. Yeah. What that, is that? A Gibson EB two, okay. I think. But I think it's been, I don't think that's the like, original. I've I played your basses. All your basses play great. So has this one been set up since? Well, No, that one's a whole different, uh, I don't know. But Actually, I can see through the action right now. Yeah, the action's that's, that's high, high, but that thing, I mean, look where the pickup is. It's just, it's a reggae bass. Let's say, you know, it's yeah. just nothing but, boy, if you don't like high end. And so what, what Stevie we'll Nicks record is that? We'll plug that in later. Okay. But Paul got me that. He made me play that because it was impossible to play. Sure. And he he thinks that he... he There's got to be some you can kind hear of that struggle, uh, which is, may or may not be true. What record? I want to go listen to the record now. Well, it was on that 14 songs record. Oh, right. Okay. But it was... I know uh, there was a song called Things... Really creative titling is going on with this project. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, Paul's, they consider, you know, he's, he's uh, to some people, I mean, it, well, Dan will tell you. He sure. was, a, he was a, he's, the replacements were a big deal for a lot of people. Okay. But, like, you nor me had a clue who they right. are. But that was a fun thing, Paul taking me shopping. We got to get you based. It's impossible to play. But well, I where, understand where did you go? that. Were you pawn shops? Where, like, where did you? Might did have you been. Go, like, we were, in, we new, were right in downtown San Francisco. So. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, because if you go new, like, everything's going to be okay. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. If you right. go to some... Uh, no, you have to go to a pawn shop. Yeah, or somebody's old cargo van where they're yeah, just because selling a, Gibsons. A brand new... It might hun- be stolen. Have you looked it up? It, like... <laughs> Well, it's got some interesting stuff, and it's definitely spent some time outdoors. Yeah. yeah it's got sun damage and, and, and whatnot. It's a cool-looking bass, though. Oh, I'll play it for you later. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get after it. It actually matches the, the wood flooring. Well, that's there. just it. It's, 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 a nice, it's a nice cosmetic it's piece It's now in, the room. in my living room as a hat stand. Yeah, it's doing a good job. It's a lid stand. Yeah, you have four, four hats on that. It's doing pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it's doing pretty good. Uh, but there's something to be. I get that, and and there are, you know, there are bass players that would be well served getting a bass that uh, prohibits them from doing certain things. You know, sure. You know, it's a governor. Yeah. Put a governor on that guy because he's played too. You know. He's right. So that's all your basses play great. That's why you heard me play all that shit earlier. Yes. You know what I mean? Like you got to put me on. The, you got to put me on the Gibson, like. Yeah. Give me to calm down. Well, it's, it's going to be worse after the coffee. We, maybe we shouldn't play. Yeah. No, I want to. <laughs> that is a very particular, fat, woolly, yeah, reggae. Just nothing but subsonic, like no mids really to speak okay. of. Just low end. Sure. I mean, the pickup is right at the heel of the neck. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And it's uh, a um, what do you call that when it's got. Uh, semi hollow? It's hollow. I what? don't think it's semi hollow. It's hollow. Right? What's the deal with semi hollow then? Well, semi hollow, I think, has. It's just chambered? Co- compart- yeah, like a compartment that's. Uh, then why do they call them chambered too? Why don't they just call them semi hollow? There's too many terms. Well, I bet you you could get. Uh, well, so, but that there's going to be somebody that could write in or. or Right. If anybody ever listened or responded, Ooh. then they would. <laughs> well, you've gotten responses already, right? I got some. I get some people, yeah. yeah. Uh, do, do, well, yeah, I think you'll get a few <coughs> helping us out with that. I, I hope so. So there's no block kind of through the body that would support be in line with the neck. Because nah. I think that's what semi-hollow means. 
Is there's like, you know, a through piece. Well, hold on. I know that the neck is not through the body. That's a bolt on neck. It, or it's set. You know what? It's not a bolt. It's definitely set. It's set. It's yeah. And then, but yeah, okay. I mean, it's very good. It's lighter than I thought it would be. <laughs> this neck. This neck is hilarious. Yeah, it's short scale, but it's uh, the neck's like sticky. Yeah. Well, like what? I mean, is that because of the weather, or just like humidity, or whatever? I from, think so. Okay. And, and this is old. Uh, little yeah, it's. I can understand the challenge. It's it's not easy to move on. Look like something the Grateful Dead. I don't. Know. Yes, it's got a Jerry Garcia vibe. But see, I but that headstock I like. We were talking about headstocks earlier. Gibson. I, I like yeah. I like the I like the headstock. Hollow body. Hollow body Gibson. Yeah. EB2. Oh, that's the model. EB2. The sticker on the inside. Okay. Yeah. It's cool. Good story. I like yeah, the I like the story. Yeah. yeah that, that, I mean, even if you don't play the bass anymore, having it around to be able to point to it and tell the story. It's uh, I I know it's I've used it since though. I oh used yeah? it um on a Richard Page record. Okay. Um on one song. How many of those sessions do you remember? Like I I there's no Half. way if someone this happened, I don't know, maybe a few months ago. This drummer gets to the gig who hadn't done the gig before. And he's like, we've played before. And I'm just what? looking at him like, um, oh, cool. Where? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, sure, man. Yeah, no, cool. Um, and then he reminded me. And like, if he wouldn't have brought up, and I remember that gig because like the load-in was a pain or something. Was it a live show? Yeah. But it's like I, I don't remember everything I've played. But you want, and it just gets worse the older you get. You sure. see, but I mean, sessions have to be the same. Like, it's just you're going to work. You're going to work. You, and that's they, why I don't post about it. That they so blur, yeah. especially when, when it was busy and we we're doing two, three sessions a day. You know, driving to three studios and yeah, and uh, yeah, same core guys. Or was this just like everybody that the studio scene was that? That was the lucrative. beauty of it. No, not the same core. Yeah, guys. I like that. It was different every time. That's fun. Could be Keltner, could be Picaro on drums, could be uh, someone I'd never met, a new guy, the band guy. Yeah. No, it's just, I mean, it's just another aspect of freelancing. And I did my share of ghosting, too, on records. Just not showing up? <laughs> no, no, no. That's a good no. story. Here's a good one for you. Um, Are you allowed to talk about this? You actually, didn't sign a. Uh, I take it back. I was I've heard about this a lot. Bass player. Okay. Not by name, because I played on a record. I heard, I thought that those dudes who like the session guys that would come in to cut a record for the band guy would not get mentioned. They weren't allowed to talk about it. Like I heard, Steve Bailey uh, has done a fair amount of that, but it can't. Uh, did you have to sign a thing? No, I didn't sign a thing, but here's what happened. We The uh, bass player did a review of, I think it was. What would be hilarious is if. They uh, did a review. The name of the band was I Mother Earth. Okay. And it was really. What, what decade is this? This would be either really early this to uh, maybe mid 90s again okay so much of this like i heard a lot me, of it was going on then yeah well what happened is the they did uh the magazine did a a write-up on it and and the and the bass player the actual bass player yeah got a lot of accolades Really? They said, look, and, and look in this section, he goes beautifully from the C uh, sharp to the D. Yeah. And then, and at the end of the day, I go, what? Wait a minute. And that's, I mean. How did you feel about that? Did, did you the, feel like, ah, that's just the job. I knew what I was getting into. Are you just like, what? No, that's me. Like, hey, hey, guys, I'm right here. I did, but I felt worse for the, the real bass player. Well, now he's got to go learn your part because he's well, got to no, cop a lot. No, but he's now forever a phony. Yeah. 
He's got to, I mean, I'd rather be me than him and that. Sure. I mean, oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I'd always be, I'd rather be the guy that can play versus the guy that can't. But that was weird. I thought that was, it, it, it didn't bother me at all. It was, no, it was, it, it's actually a, even more of a compliment because you know you were, you know. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're getting, the playing is getting acknowledged. Yeah. Right. That's cool. That was interesting, though. So the, I I take it back. I've been you've been unknowingly mentioned. Yeah, in your playing has been mentioned. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That was a good one. I forgot about that. But it was also extremely um, no, almost prog rock. It was a hard record to do. Okay, and but that's kind of in your wheelhouse. It is, but the, these records are no, you know, the worst thing for me, I don't know how other bass players feel, but to go in and do a whole album of just bass, like overdubbing the bass on yeah. everything. Right. So, no, and there were other bands, I remember, replacing it, then the bass player's there, he's watching you, the real so, guy so in you the were, band. Were you playing his part, or you, you played your part? In most cases on this record, it was... It was so fusiony. There were the these riffs. It was very oh, yeah. riffy. You know? Okay. So the whole I, band actually, riffs. I, yeah. yeah. So it was more like I I was just in there to play the same stuff he would like his parts. Yeah. But in time, sure. Blah blah blah. Execute it better. Uh, and then then there were other times where. Uh, what's the name of that band? Kirstein. What was the name of the band that? Uh, we might have to edit this. No, leave it. What was the name of the band that that Nick liked? Throwing Muses. Yeah, there was a band called Throwing Muses, okay. and there were another like alternative thing in the '90s that was kind of cool stuff. Yeah. But I had to ghost on that, and um, but. The bass player was there in my face the whole time. That's a little weird, right? Because yeah. yeah. he's a little angry with you to begin with. Right. He feels insecure because yeah. you're the guy coming in to replace him. And he's like, oh, I could do that. Yeah. But but in all these experiences, the, it always ended up fine. We became friends, and well, that's cool. you know, I mean, I, yeah. Um, so now, where did you? To talk about part creation, uh, I mean, I could ask you a bunch of questions about it, but actually, I kind of want you to speak openly on where you're coming from when creating a part. Obviously, you mentioned the melody and having the melody present. Um, where, where are you coming from and how much do the actual lyrics, the content of the lyrics, how much do those affect? Zero. Your, okay. Content for of me, lyrics. Yeah. because I'm not listening to the, I, you know, I like many, maybe a few of you out there don't really listen to lyrics that much initially at when first I first, it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, they, they're not, it's not the. It's an instrument to me. It's a sound. Sure. And so um, I, it's the, it, it's melody based entirely. I, okay. I, so the lyrics. Uh, the, at least for me, right. have no impact. Okay. It, could, it could be, you know, Japanese for, for sure. all I care. But, uh, yeah, th nothing. But melody, vibe, uh, the timing, even a little bit of the vocals, and just, it's huge. Mm -hmm. Huge, huge, huge. And then, so that's going to influence your part, and that's going to, for those reasons, you know, where the space is at, the, the nature of phrasing, you know, is it maybe how rhythmic the phrasing is versus these longer notes that you have to create some motion underneath? It's a that's a tough. Uh, that's yeah. It's a difficult thing to even describe. Like it where, is. how do you come up? Where do the parts come from? You know. Sure. And uh, and and trust me, there's been plenty of times where, oops, nothing's coming to mind here. Uh, what's what's not, your what's your move there? Like where do you go if you hear a tune? You're in a session, whatever, and it's like. Nothing is inspiring with that kind of inner ear. Well, you look for the most simple, you know, common denominator. What? Let's just start something real simple. Yeah. I mean, let's. 
I mean, that's a that's a that's tough when that happens. I gotta say, that's one of those more. Yeah, that can get a little little scary. But don't be afraid to ask. You know, sure. what do you, you know, I'll ask the producer or the songwriter, or whatever. Like, what do you hear here? I mean, is it? Can you give? You know, give me a little bit of. A, so I, I ask for help. Yeah, that's obviously all. sure. That's all. And then being in, since there is so much freedom, uh, uh, when you're doing all these sessions back in the, you know, but late seventies all the way through mid nineties. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you're working with a lot of the same guys. Then it's it becomes seventies, eighties, nineties. Wow, yeah. almost yeah, late seventies, seventies, eighties, nineties. Bet Midler was be old. seventy. I must be old or no, something. No, 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 you're not. Four decades. And that's amazing. Yeah, there's a few of us around, though. Yeah. There are. Um, there are a few of us around. That, that made me think of something else. So I want to get this question out. You're, you're working with a lot of the same guys. Like the, those are just the other studio players on the scene. So there's a lot of that. Did you ever just like, you know, hey, Jeff Picaro, I'm hearing this. Did he ever chime in? And that's, I only used him no. because we were talking. No. Did other instrumentalists? Oh, Jeff wouldn't. No, I mean, I know not Jeff specifically. No, but I mean. We were talking um, about him earlier. Uh, no, I mean, I, I think in most cases, uh, no, I think it, yeah, no it was one, really just left to the musician on, at it, hand. Yeah. I love that. Like I say, I think we're specialists. Yeah. You know, we're the medical, you know, I mean, you're, you know, base is your territory. But um, yeah, if I if I'm at a loss for a part, I'm gonna go to the producer or the songwriter for assistance. And, sure. You know, you know, help me with this. What do you hear? Yeah. Because do you, do you find that they're ever that they would be good at articulating how they hear the bass? Because like not everybody no, really a, knows what the oh, hell we're even doing. They knows when it they know when it's wrong, but. Other than that, they have no idea what we're doing. That's a whole other, yeah, that that's a whole other thing that that you need to get some skill at is that to understanding what people are trying to tell you right, w right. W when they can't speak musically. You know, the, um, you just have to feel it out. Even if somebody says it's, you know, if they start using colors sure. or. Um, I might have mentioned last time we talked to you. Uh, I got the studio notes of put a mustache on it. <laughs> and you just put a mustache on it and you know and then i was i thought it was hilarious and that guy's still one of my best friends what did friends. that mean to you though uh just give it something th yeah like i you i don't, don't even know I, 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 I knew what he meant but i don't know how i could yeah okay a mustache i mean i'm gonna need some clarification Fu no, Manchu, is there a soul patch combo? What are the sideburns like? Yeah. You know, but after I figure all that out, the complete facial hair scenario, I think then it it's does, one take. Yeah, I think it does help. Then you can sort of, you start thinking of other bands and, and uh, you know, bass players with facial hair. Yeah, I mean, right. It's just ZZ Top. You know, that, that's a beard. I'm going to start there and then we'll just trim back no, until we get to just the mustache. I think it's great. I think, I, I mean, I, I have no problem with the unmusical singers giving me weird, you know, sure. and I think, you know, some musicians have more patience with that stuff than others. Um, <laughs> you seem like you'd do pretty good in that scenario. Well, you know what? Even if you don't agree, you just, you know, there are ways of yeah. just going. I'll, I'll tell you all a, a quick little trick. You say, it's a great idea. <laughs> Kaboom. Yeah. Done. Done. That's a great idea. Now, whether or not you apply it, you know, it's like the old thing with producers, you know, where they say, could you do what, you, something with the sound, can you change that? Yeah. And you go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you make a big job, some job on the knob. Yeah. And then, and then you go, all right, how's that? Yeah. Invariably. Right. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's uh, those little tricks. Sure. But yeah, make, you know, you, you don't want, uh, the worst thing you can do is to act like you know right. that they're wrong. Right. No, you can't do that. Never. No. I mean, I mean, in general and in life, no one wants to feel alienated like that. Everybody wants to feel heard and understood and 
especially when it comes to something so personal as to music making. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, that's just another thing to remember is when you go in and you're working for a, a singer songwriter, this is pretty important to them. Oh, yeah. You know, and you're working with their. I mean, this is their whole life, and you don't want to belittle it in any way. And you, you want them to know that you're you're yeah. you're bored. No, you want to make it as you know. Sure, sure. I mean, that's it's an interesting thing because if you cut two other sessions, if you did two other records that day, that was just whatever. That was the first or the second or the third session you did for the day, but you are their bass player. Done. That was just gig number one for you for that day, let alone the week or month or whatever. That's but right. you are their bass player. No, that's you're right, Ryan. That's and I exactly. think I think it's definitely. Uh, it took me a little while to kind of learn that, but I think letting them know as their bass player, and this goes across the board to any musician that like, yeah, you're in. This is their thing. This is whether they're funding it privately or it's their emotional or life experience that made these songs come to life, you're you're a part of that now and you're their bass player. Yeah. Even though that's just like, well, that's my day money and I'm going to play this gig at night for me. But you have to be there as their bass player. Like, I think if you view it from their side of the fence, yeah, it, spent, it'll hopefully give you a better perspective on how to interact with folks. I spent two months in the studio with Courtney Love. Okay. Um, rehearsing. And that was an amazingly good test of all the above what yeah. we're talking about. Because, first of all, her session, her, the, we would start at 10 o'clock at Damn. night, I guess, go to about 6, okay. 7 in the morning for weeks at a time. And this was not really great for my health. Right. But, you know, what year is this? Is this in the, high, the nah, heyday of Courtney? No, it was after, you know, all you the. Know, it was probably 2005, maybe, three, four. Man, I used to see her around the swing house quite a bit around then. What's the swing house? The swing house was that big lockout over in Hollywood off of uh, like Willoughby. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. She was around there a lot. A I think trip. she was just getting ready for some tour or something. I mean, that was. Uh, the height of of me being patient. Okay. Well, she know. is she is scatterbrained as I assume she is. Unbelievable. Yeah. She all strung out. I mean, I don't want to like air out her laundry, but was she My she difficult the, to work based with? Based on the hours we were working, I thought that yeah. Yeah. Could have been a little bit more concise. Yeah, and and money was sort of I mean, it wasn't cheap for her. Right. But we would just do these songs, the same songs every night uh, ad nauseum, and nothing was ever changing. Never even made the record. <laughs> right. I don't think it. You know, I think. Uh, I don't. I think financially she'll still be okay. But yeah. But but that was a good example of you know when. Of course, then again, you're getting paid too. See, that I mean, helps. I was going to ask you because, like, as much of a drag it is, I'm like. That's probably a high budget project, so will, you're doing okay, even though it's it's really throwing the rest of your, your scheduling and potential work or whatever off. Just, just it was just un, just unhealthy, yeah. basically. <clears throat> but um, weird thing, it was a <clears throat> that was a very strange uh, little project. Yeah, nothing ever happened. Just showing up. She and told she would <clears throat> would get there and uh, basically she'd hold the mic, tell stories. Yeah, yeah. Just Whether it be about Kurt sure. or whatever, or but you always had to have the mic. Yeah. It was funny, huh? But it was really it wasn't it wasn't about the music for her. It was about some yeah. nostalgic thing. If she's telling stories about Kurt and still being with the band at late night hours, it's it has nothing to do with music. It has it has to do with reliving something or connecting with something. Yeah. maybe. and was she involved or so? I'm, I'm guessing she was involved with Ed Norton. Oh, I don't know about that. Because you talk about him a lot. Really? Yeah. Something. Brilliant actor. No, no shit. Really yeah. good. Yeah. One Which of my favorite actors. He is great. Yeah. I haven't seen him in... I think the last thing I saw him in was Birdman. What a great movie. That was a good movie. One of the best soundtracks of all time. Dude, did I tell you that I did a, a whole score of just upright bass 
The director called me and she wanted that. She wanted like that Birdman feel. For on acoustic on bass. On acoustic bass. It's, uh, I'm going to see it for the first time tomorrow. I mean, I sa- I've seen it a bunch with the director. And but are you going to see did, did you get to go to the soundstage when they were mixing it? Or? Uh, I was there while they were plugging it all in, yeah. So, and like, I mean, I was very int- uh, involved with where all the music happened and occurred and came in and out. And where is it? Where are you going to see it? Uh, like, uh, in a um, movie theater? Um, tomorrow is the casting crew only at the theater that the director owns. So the director founded or co-founded the Groundlings uh, comedy thing. See, you are tapped into comedy too. I'm I'm interested in comedy. But it'll have a good sound system. Yeah, it should, it should be okay. My friend, my friend Dan, uh, engineered it, did a fantastic job and, uh, I'm going to go get to experience and meet these people. Like, you know, I've, I've been working on this film. Well, Actually, I knocked it out in like two weeks. Plugged it? Yeah, what's the name of the film? Uh, the name of the film is The Show Can't Go On. I think it's got a website up. It is a mockumentary about this theater production that just tanks. It's it's. I want to check uh, this out. No, and, was, I, and I'm sure a lot of people here want to hear. This couldn't have happened at a better time because I was playing a musical theater show at the time. So like... You know, one of my gigs was I'm playing a musical theater thing, and then the next gig I'm composing for this movie about a theater thing. So it it just worked out perfectly that I could realistically like pull from ideas and things I was uh, experiencing while playing the musical theater show. And I'm secretly while I'm playing that book, you know, the nights I would do that the show, like I'm looking at how the the themes are connected to the characters, and I'm kind of keeping track of the whole sound uh but is it every every single cue mm-hmm. is upright bass every, that's it just like one or did you ever multi-track or no. just one I, I i sat and watched the movie i'd work out an idea per character and then and then i just did a couple of random cues that would be scattered in there but it's very character based so it, that every character has a theme and it's a full length hour and a half Wow, uh, how much? How many minutes of music? It's throughout. Wow. So it's uh, yeah. There's a lot of music in there. This guy works hard, folks. That is <laughs> not an easy job. That is a lot of work. That, that was fun, man. I got I got this text message from my friend who I think was in Taiwan at the time. He's like, "Yo, man, it's so and so on a on a SIM card right now. Like, I'm gonna put you in touch with the director. You want to do this? I don't know. Have her call me. Like, it sounds fun." Uh, what a great experience. Yeah, um, like when's that ever going to happen again? Well, hopefully next year. Well, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be the solo of, bass yeah. soundtrack guy. Well, Maybe know, me and Antonio could double up. Boy, I, you know. Boy. Then you there you go. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It's such a great way to, it's, it's, I like any, you know, try to, you know, maybe the next one's just electric bass. Mm. I'm going to come over here and borrow, I'm going to borrow yeah. that Gibson. That's what I'm going to do. You are, you you take the, (laughs) just take it now. (laughs) By the way, Ryan, you are welcome to any of these bases anytime you want. Man, I like to, you got a great base collection. Yeah, well, we should, uh, well, I'll take you to the Cartage place and we'll go look at some of the other ones. Where is that? Is that in LA? Yeah, it's in North Hollywood. Okay. Yeah, there's a bunch of those places up there. Yeah. Third Encore. That's what I was trying to remember earlier when oh, we were talking. Oh, the, the rehearsal. Yeah, but they also have all those storage uh, joints. It's there. not. It's right. It, the, all the it's in that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's where everything near is. the airport there. Yeah, dude, thanks for doing this. That's it. Well, you want to keep going? Mm-hmm. I would have mm-hmm. to release the two episodes, and mm-hmm. I got a gig. Let's I do th- another one. You uh, want to be? You got to be like a, a recurring. Uh, yeah. Maybe we do like. Ten, maybe you come to interviews ten with me. Dips. Ten minute bits, you know. Maybe we could. Oh, you're you're a segment guy. You yeah, you could be a segment guy. Like you know, you know. We need. We, what's the name of the segment? We need to. Yeah, we have to think. We of need. That. We need the segment name. What time? Is your, what time is your? You gotta get going. Uh yeah, I gotta leave in uh, about ten minutes. Well, Ryan, thanks, man. Dude, thank you. Uh, and, We're definitely gonna do uh, this. There's tomorrow. so much, you know. The, it's hard to talk. I mean, gosh darn it. When I think about doing these things, if there's anything I want to relate to. to the youngsters or, or people yeah. i mean I, I, there's more to say yeah. but but my god but just don't let anyone deter you even yeah. if i'm about to no i mean <laughs> it's harder than ever no question about it sure. harder than a- ever to be a studio musician if that's what you aspire to be 
But if you want to be the best bassist in the world, that's a good one too. But you might might want to practice a little bit. Yeah. What do you what? Now you told me a funny story that I thought was great. You told me that you went to like a local music store here in LA and you just wanted to take lessons with whoever was right. the teacher there because you just wanted to check in. Oh, I'm, now I'm, you've already been on like timeless records. You've worked with the Beatle, you've worked with the Stone, you worked with Tom Petty, you worked with Bat Midler, all this stuff, and you're going to the local music store to just to check in. What were you? Uh, did you have an expectation? You could did you never, you know, yeah. I mean, I like, I mean, there's there's things I see young players do that I certainly have no idea what they're doing. I want to learn it, you know. Yeah. I mean, and and um, I, you know, uh, just just I mean, these people are doing things that I don't know how to do. And maybe like it's like you say, you know, the way you your string overlapping. Or, I'm going to take a lesson from you. <laughs> I am, and we'll do a. A bit on that. Yeah, I let's will do absolutely it. take a lesson from you. Man, sure. How's your sight reading? My sight reading has gotten better from uh, doing all the transcriptions. transcriptions. So, so I have to write it all. Um, and now I can, like, when I hear something, I can visualize the rhythm. Like, really pretty good. Like, it's a, there's a direct connection to the visualization. Uh, and since figures going through. become sentences. and, and Yeah. Just and, like and, and, you know, and then you can also picture it on the neck, too. So, uh, it, 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 I mean, that's a skill that comes just like the reading, the writing comes with just practice too. Uh, wow. being able to write all that stuff, but my, my sight reading is getting better, getting better. Get, I don't, the thing is with sight reading, we I don't really have to don't read get, regularly. Yeah, exactly. We don't get that much opportunity. And if we do, it could be a little scary. Yeah. If there's a red light involved <laughs> and all that. Okay, guys, ready? Three, Man, four. I, I don't think I've ever... <gasps> I don't know if I've ever been to a session that I can remember where I had to read a notated chart. I will leave you with this one story. Um, what was the Jim Carrey first comedy that put him all over the map? Ace Zoo- Ventura? Yes. You uh, did that movie? Yeah. Okay. Did and you do both of them? One and two? It was just one. Okay. I, th- I believe. Uh, 110 piece orchestra. Yeah. But uh, pop style. So it's like. Uh, it was Boogaloo. Yeah. Which is the, very difficult to read for mm-hmm. me. I don't know. I, there just seems like there's some weird rests involved. Okay. You know, uh, especially then. I'm, I mean, you know, by then so I had some lapse in, in my sight Who's reading. Who was the composer but, on that movie? Um, hey, Google. <laughs> hey, Google, who was the... If you can't hear it. I have a newborn. I how come? Newborn. How come the Google device doesn't have a name like Alexa? Can you give it a name, or is it always just Google? Hey, just hey Google. Or just hey Google. I think you can't. You can give it a it's name. It's a very right? casual greeting yes. too. Pardon me. Can you any entry? Like, can you do any? Hey. Yeah. Hey. Sup. Sup, Google. Hey. <laughs> uh, I renew newborn. So 110, 110 piece orchestra. Mm-hmm. Get to a queue. A tough one, evidently. Okay. I kept fucking it up. Yeah. So they they got to stop the orchestra every you know, time. Finally, Ira. This was on the microphone to everybody in the room. <coughs> yeah. John, you're not reading. John, you're not reading. <laughs> 110 people yeah. look at me, like like what what the hell are you doing here? This guy's not capable. Right. Somehow got through it, but that was a all right. There's a catastrophe. Yeah, major session. Yeah. Yeah, major embarrassment too. Uh, so embarrassed. Yeah. And thankfully, me and Ira became. Good, okay. Good did that? Friends. But like very next take, did you just like okay? No. You still had a couple. <laughs> <laughs> still a little stumbling. No, okay. it worked out good, and and you know, I mean, I don't think it. Um, had much effect on the movie. Sure. And, you know, I think the movie did all right. Might have cost the uh, Universal, whoever, a couple extra bucks for it. Yeah, well. But maybe if I were the rest of the band, I would have been happy for this guy's actually putting money in our pocket. Yeah, exactly. Right, because then you're going into overtime. Tell you're not reading. <laughs> I, and I remember what I said. Which was? No shit. <laughs> we'll leave you with that. John Pierce, folks. 
<laughs> that was good. If you have enjoyed this episode and you're interested to know what else is happening with the base shed, uh, you can you can find me on Facebook backslash the base shed, Instagram at the base shed, Twitter at base shed. So that was my talk with John. He's such a sweetheart. He's just this down to earth guy. Uh, he's great. He's great. I remember the first when we met up at the York and we were doing that. He uh, <laughs> he's like, all right, my turn to interview you. And he just started asking me questions. It was it was hilarious and great. Um, we also did like spend a fair amount of time talking about comedy and comedians. Uh, yeah, that's something that we both kind of have in common. Um, it's fun. I, I, I can't wait to have him back. I'm really, really looking forward to that. There's, there's a bunch of stuff there that I'm, I'm sure we can get into. And I think, I mean, there's stuff there that probably has nothing to do with the base that we would re- get into. I definitely want to talk to him about composing as well. Um, I know he's done... He's done some of that. Um, I will have his all music credits up. There's a link to that at uh, thebayshed.com backslash podcast. Go to the John Pierce episode. I will have a link up there. Uh, So you can check out, uh, you know, some of his resume. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. It's pretty intense. Um, Yeah, that's all I got, folks. That's all I got. That was John Pierce. uh, Round one of John Pierce. He'll be back. And, um, yeah, I will catch you on the next one.